Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Rama Devi, Professor and Head, Department of Anatomy from Pondicherry Institute of Medical Sciences. Today, we are discussing on the lungs. No, let me repeat. So, just before we start off with the lecture, let us have a case scenario, which will, uh, which over the session, we will be able to answer the questions which follows that Mr. X 45 years old is a chronic smoker over the last six months he developed severe cough occasional hemoptysis tiredness and lost weight significantly x-ray chest followed by CT scan revealed that he had bronchogenic carcinoma Biopsy of the regional lymph nodes confirmed the diagnosis. Surgical resection was planned. The questions that we would like to answer are Did his lifestyle habituations contribute to his illness? What could be the possible cause of the cough? How does the biopsy of the lymph node help in diagnosis. Thus, knowledge of the bronchopulmonary segments help in surgical treatment. The specific learning objectives for this session would be where we would discuss on the gross features of the lungs, talk on the fissures and lobes of the lungs, um, explain the mediastinal surface and impressions on the lungs, hilum and the root of the lungs, discuss the blood supply and the nerve supply, review the lymphatic drainage and talk on bronchopulmonary segments and various clinical anatomy pertaining to these topics. So coming to talk of the gross anatomy, the lung has an apex which is located above, the base of the inferior surface which is below and the three borders, a sharp anterior border, a rounded posterior border and a sharp inferior border. The surfaces are the coastal and the mediastinal surface. Let us look at the gross features and discuss the apex. The apex is the upper portion of the lungs which is located 3 to 4 centimeters above the first rib and coastal cartilage or 2.5 centimeters uh, above the medial end of the sternoclavicular joint. It is covered by the pleural membrane and reinforced by the suprapleural membrane. The relations of the apex are at the anterior, posterior and lateral aspects are similar to both uh, similar on both the right side and the left side. So talking of the anterior relations, we have the subclavian artery which passes upwards and outside and just below the subclavian artery is the subclavian vein and with the scalenous anterior muscle close to its insertion between the artery and the vein. The internal thoracic artery 
is also seen over here arising from the first part of the subclavian artery. Coming to talk of the posterior relations, middlemost and posteriorly is the sympathetic trunk. The stellate ganglion may be seen alongside. Then there is a posterior uh, intercostal artery, the first one which drains passes on to drain into the corresponding brachiocephalic vein. There is a superior intercostal artery arising from the costocervical branch of the subclavian artery and there is the anterior division of the ventral rami of the first thoracic nerve that is T1 as it proceeds to join with the ventral rami of C8 to form the lower cord of the brachial plexus which is then seen on the so talking of the posterior relations on the posterior most side we have the sympathetic trunk with or without uh, with or without the stellate ganglion then there is the first posterior intercostal vein which passes on to drain into the brachiocephalic vein of its own side. There is a superior intercostal artery arising from the costal cervical branch of the subclavian artery and there is the ventral rami of the first thoracic nerve which proceeds further to join with the ventral rami of C8 to form the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. This lower trunk of the brachial plexus is seen on the lateral side along with the scalenus medius muscle. Now talking of the medial relations, they are slightly different for the right side and on the left side. On the right side, we have the right brachiocephalic vein along with the right phrenic nerve and pericardiacophrenic vessels. Following that is the brachiocephalic trunk and then the uh, trachea and the right vagus nerve. Whereas on the left side we have the left brachiocephalic vein and the left subclavian vein which replaces the brachiocephalic trunk of the right side and posterior to that we have the esophagus and the thoracic duct. Now a stab injury to the neck can also cause an injury to the apex of the lung leading on to an open pneumothorax. If there is a tumor or growth in the apex of the lung all the above mentioned structures may be compressed or affected and produce a condition what we call it as a thoracic inlet syndrome. Depending upon the structures that are affected, the patient may have one or many of the following manifestations. There may be edema of the face and a swelling with a dusky color due to the compression of the brachiocephalic trunk and the vessels. The radial artery may be feeble or not palpable if the subclavian vessels are affected. The hemidiaphragm of the concerned side may suffer paralysis if the phrenic nerve is involved. There may sometimes be hoarseness of the voice due to involvement of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Having looked at the apex, now we look at the base which is the inferior or the inferior surface which is resting below covered by the pleural membrane and resting over each dome of the diaphragm. And here it is related on the right side 
to the right lobe of the liver and on the left side to the left lobe of the liver to the fundus of the stomach and to the spleen. Looking at the borders, the anterior border is sharp for both sides which is more or less straight on the right side whereas on the left side there is towards the lower portion there is a deviation what is called as a cardiac notch with a small projection uh, which is called as a lingula. This is a way of identification of the right lung and the left lung by looking for the cardiac notch and the lingula. The posterior border is rounded and rests on the paravertebral gutter and related to the upper 10 thoracic uh, vertebrae. The inferior border is sharp and it encloses the base. Now the surfaces are two, the coastal surface which is covered by the pleura and separated from the lateral thoracic wall by the endothoracic fascia. It is more or less smooth but it bears the impressions of the ribs and the coastal cartilages and alternating with the elevations of the intercostal spaces. The medial or the mediastinal surface is specific and bears the impressions of very many structures and different on the right side and left side. Now looking at the mediastinal surface of the right lung, the most prominent thing that we see is the uh, structure which is called as the hilum of the lung. This is a region where various structures enter and leave the root of the lung and this hilum represents the lateral portion of the root. It is covered by a sleeve of uh, pleura which at the lower portion uh, forms a bilaminar fold called as a pulmonary ligament. The contents are specific in the root of the lung in the hilum. There is the epiterial bronchus, there is the hyperterial bronchus with the pulmonary artery in between and pulmonary veins. The pulmonary ligament consists of loose areola tissue and it might have a few lymph nodes, bronchial vessels. Just anterior to the hilum of the lung is the region of the cardiac impression and on the right lung we have the impressions formed by the anterior surface of the right auricle, the anterior and right um, border of the right atrium and the uh, anterior part of a part of the right ventricle. Just below the cardiac impression, in, uh, there is a small impression in front of the pulmonary ligament which is by the inferior vena cava as it passes on to open into the atrium. Now at the upper end of the cardiac region, there is a vertical impression the lower part of which is formed by the superior vena cava and the upper part by the brachiocephalic vein. And posterior to the brachiocephalic vein is the impression formed by the brachiocephalic trunk and at the more towards the apex by the subclavian artery. Now above the arch of the hilum there is an impression which is formed by the arch of the acygos vein as it proceeds to open into the superior vena cava. And just above this arch, the central region, uh, uh, there is the impression formed by the trachea and the vagus. Um, in the, behind the pulmonary ligament, we have the impression 
created by the esophagus. Now, coming to look at the mediastinal surface of the left lung, we see the rounded region that represents the posterior part or the vertebral part and the conspicuous region is the hilum of the lung which consists of the openings of the bronchus, the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins and anterior to the hilum we have the cardiac impression which is mainly formed by the anterior surface of the left ventricle and part of the anterior surface of the right ventricle. Just at the upper portion of the cardiac uh, impression, there is a small impression may be seen formed by the pulmonary trunk. Arching over the cardiac impression, sorry to uh, repeat, Arching over the hilum of the lung, we have a curved impression formed by the arch of the iota, which if you see proceeds vertically down formed by the descending thoracic iota. Now, at the upper portion, we have a couple of impressions which seem to be uh, dipping into this curved arch of iota impression that is formed by the left common carotid artery and by the left subclavian artery. Posterior to that is an impression formed by the esophagus and thoracic duct. The same esophagus also produces an impression uh, behind the pulmonary ligament at the lower portion of the uh, hilar root. Yet another um, conspicuous feature is the cardiac notch, the code cardiac notch and the projection that we see that is the lingula of, uh, lingula of the lung. Now having seen the relations of the uh, lung at various aspects, we see the fissures and lobes of the lung. The lobes are superior and inferior, separated by an oblique fissure that is the most commonly seen one and most, let me repeat this. Having seen the relations of the lung, we now proceed to look at the fissures and the lobes that are formed. The oblique fissure is a common one found in both the right and the left lung. To talk of the oblique fissure, it starts somewhat above and behind the root of the lung, passes upwards and backwards and then proceeds along the coastal surface which we are not able to see over here but we can imagine. So as it goes along the coastal surface, it cuts across the posterior border at the level of T3, T4 spine and then passes downwards and backwards along the coastal surface meeting the mid axillary line at the fifth intercostal space, proceed further down, comes to the inferior border at the sixth coastal cartilage about 7.5 centimeters from the midline and then proceeds further forward to meet the hilum of the lung at, the, at its anterior and lower end. So this fissure, oblique fissure divides the lung into a superior lobe and an inferior lobe. This plane of cleavage also has a functional implication that is the superior lobe moves laterally and forwards with the elevation of the ribs during respiration whereas the inferior lobe passes downwards and backwards 
due to the piston action of the diaphragm. Now, along uh, apart from the oblique fissure, the right lung also has a horizontal fissure which starts from the oblique fissure at the mid axillary line that is at the fifth coastal cartilage and proceeds forward to cut at the sixth coastal cartilage thereby dividing the superior lobe into a superior lobe and a middle lobe. Now looking at the left lung there is a single oblique fissure which is more vertical when compared to that of the right lung and divides the lobe into a, right, a superior and an inferior lobe. Now to recapitulate the structures at the hilum of the lung, in both the lungs the anterior to posterior um, positioning of the structures are the same with the pulmonary vein, pulmonary artery and the bronchus. Whereas from superior to inferior on the right lung we see a parterial bronchus pulmonary artery, hyparterial bronchus and pulmonary vein. This is because the principal bronchus divides much early than uh, entering the lung and thereby, uh, thereby we have the uh, two bronchus with the pulmonary artery in between. Whereas on the left lung we have the pulmonary artery, principal bronchus and the pulmonary way. This is a pictorial representation of the various structures seen in the root of the lung. Apart from the major structures that we mentioned, there are also pulmonary plexus, some nerve endings, there are small bronchial vessels, some bronchopulmonary nodes and the pulmonary ligament has got loose radial art tissue with small vessels and lymph nodes. Coming to talk about the blood supply of the lung, the arteries for the conducting part on the left side there are two bronchial arteries arising from the branch of the descending thoracic iota. Whereas on the right side there is a single bronchial artery which might arise from the descending iota or it might be a branch of the third right posterior intercostal artery or it might be a branch coming from the left bronchial artery. However, the respiratory part of the lung is mainly supplied through the pulmonary artery through various pulmonary capillary plexus. To talk about the venous drainage, the arteries on having reached the lungs, they divide and form ramifications, they form multiple branches, the main part of which is the tubular or the septal branch. The tubular branch mainly supplies the lung parenchyma through pulmonary plexuses whereas the septal branch mainly supply the pleura through bronchial capillary plexus. All these plexus eventually drain into the pulmonary or the bronchial veins. The bronchial veins are of two uh, types that is superficial and the deep veins. There are two bronchial veins on each side. The right side eventually drains into the ascygos vein and the left side drains into the ascygos vein, sorry to repeat. The left side drains into the hemiacygos vein or the left superior intercostal vein. The superficial veins drain into the right heart that is through the ascygos and the hemiacygos system and the deep veins pass into the left heart. So, lungs are mainly drained 
by the pulmonary veins that is the superior and inferior veins which eventually open into the left atrium. Mind, uh, mind you, the pulmonary veins carry the pure blood. Coming to talk of the nerve supply, the lungs are supplied by the anterior and posterior pulmonary plexus which is formed mainly of the parasympathetic and sympathetic system. The parasympathetic fibers come in through the vagus which are motor to the bronchial muscles. So, they produce bronchospasm. They are secretor motor to the mucous glands and they carry the sensory impulses that is the stretch and the cough uh, impulses. Sorry, they, I have to repeat this. They also call, uh, carry the sensations, the stretch and the cough reflex sets in. The sympathetic fibers mainly come through the T2 to T5 spinal segments and basically they inhibit the parasympathetic action. They are by and large vas vasomotor and they are bronchodilators. Irritation of the nerve endings in the bronchial mucous membrane can initiate a cough reflex which are carried to the parasympathetic system. Talking about the lymphatic drainage of the lungs, there is a superficial system and a deep system. The superficial system as the name uh, denotes lies beneath the pleura and they main, mainly drain the extra pulmonary bronchi. The deep ones are basically intrapulmonary in location, draining the bronchial tree, pulmonary vessels and connective tissue septa. Both the superficial and the deep veins then pass on to the bronchopulmonary lymph nodes which are located at the hilum and these then continue into the superior and inferior tracheobronchial lymph nodes which are located at the subcarinal region. Thereafter, they form the right and the left bronchomediastinal trunks. These trunks eventually drain at the base of the neck through the left uh, lymphatic trunk or through the thoracic duct. If the deep lymphatics are blocked, they may communicate through alternate channels with the superficial ones and drain into the hilar lymph nodes. The terminal part of the lymphatics is intercepted by the supraclavicular deep cervical lymph nodes which act as the scintillin nodes. Now to talk about the bronchopulmonary segments. 